Now let's look at the throughput of the counting. So from our early section we've talked about when we are performing the limiting factor analysis, we consider the limiting factor or one single limiting factor within a company. But at the same time, we ignore those departments or processes. Because think about it this way. You've got the factory and the factory, the capacity may be like this. So that means, okay, the capacity for departments number one is to deal with, let's say, 50 units of product. But when it comes to department two, this is the bottleneck, it's actually 30 units of the maximum capacity. And department three, again, let's say 60 units. So if that's the case then, when the department one buys the raw materials at 50 units, only 30 can be processed into the department number two. And that means at this particular point in time, we've got 20 units of this raw materials or inventory staying within the warehouse as the closing inventory. But at the same time, the labor operating in this particular department will simply just sit there and drinking coffee as to get paid perhaps. So if that's the case then, those are called the inefficiency within the organization. So yes, we've got the limiting capacity, for example, because of machine hours, and hence we can deal with different number of units for different departments in turn. But we can, argue, but we can also argue that, okay, we've got a product here, so product one as well as the product two. When going through each of these departments, now we are taking into account the departments when we are considering the limiting factor. So that's the reason why, instead of using the marginal costing terminologies, so for example, the marginal costing, is when we are considering the contribution that we can make, we take the total sales revenue minus the total variable costs, but that would just to be based upon the number of units that we can sell. So we can calculate, for example, selling price minus the number of units that we've sold minus the variable cost times the number of units that we've sold based upon the matching principle but of course you have already ignored the inefficiency yeah for example the closing inventories that you can't sell that they just stay there you have to look after them labor we cheat that as the variable cost in a marginal costing system, that would be no problem. But from a throughput accounting's perspective, we cheat the labour costs as fixed rather than variable. Because think about it this way. We've got a production line. All of this infrastructure has been set to appropriately. If, for example, the production worker called Mary has left the company, in order to avoid this inefficiency, all we need to do is we're going to employ the new worker, for example, called John, into the production line to replace the Mary. So if that's the case then, even though the labour, yes, may leave the company, but they will be replaced relatively easily. So we're going to cheat the labour costs as fixed. So why are we going to consider, why are we going to use the throughput accounting then? Onto your next two pages of your notes, you can see the throughput accounting application. There will be two ways that we're going to apply the throughput accounting. First of all, very, very similar to limiting factor analysis or limiting factor decision, we're going to rank the order in order to decide which polar we should produce first before the second one by considering the bottleneck related to each of these processes as well as the department rather than the pot or rather than the company as a whole. Okay, because we know that, for example, in this case, the department two will certainly be a bottleneck because if you're not going to increase the capacity of the department two, surely there will be 20 units of inventory 
staying in there as the closing inventory, which would be the inefficiency, or we can call it as the waste. So all we can do in this particular case is either we're going to reduce the capacity of the department one, where not this will be the case. That really depends, because if we were to limit the capacity, it will impact on our sales revenue for, the, for different products. So perhaps the more sensible ways that we can do is we're going to increase the capacity of the department two. Let me just use red. So if that's the case then, as you can see, after we've increased the capacity of the department two, perhaps there'll be no bottleneck anymore. Okay, to be 50. But still, there would be the bottleneck for department one as well as the department two, because for department three, now is to be 60, right? So we're going to consider to increase the capacity again for department one as well as the department two. So that will be a continuous management process for the organization to improve its efficiency. And we're going to decide which product we should make first and which port we should make secondly. Given those bottlenecks exists in each of these departments, it's simply because when we are producing, for example, port one, it has to go through department one, two, and three. Yes, so that's the reason why we need to take that into account. For example, the bottleneck when we are producing a port. Secondly, we are going to assess whether or not the product is profitable. Because we later on, we're going to calculate something called the throughput accounting ratio. Or we can call it the TPAR. If it's greater than one, okay, profitable. Less than one, less, not very, very profitable. Um, equals to one, break even situation. And if less than one, of course, we're going to think about ways to improve its profitability by considering those bottleneck resources exist in the fat chain in the first place. So that's how we use the throughput accounting. And of course you can argue that throughput accounting is a very, very clever idea. Because instead of considering the number of units that we've sold for the variable cost, for example, the direct material costs associated with that, but we are considering the total materials that we purchase in the first place. Because why are we going to use that then? We use that, for example, for management purposes because we assume that company using a throughput accounting method will operate its business under the just-in-time inventory management system. So if that's the case then, rather than considering the number of units that we've sold, what will be the direct material costs associated with them, we are considering the total materials that we purchased in order to eliminate those materials or eliminate those closing inventory or eliminate those inefficiencies down to zero. So there will be a difference between the throughput accounting terminology on your next two, uh, three pages, uh, three pages. The difference is between the marginal is most the throughput accounting. But the best way from my perspective is first of all, I'm gonna take you through to how we're gonna identify the bottleneck first of all before we discuss about that concept. So the bottleneck for the processes within a company as a whole. So let's see then requires bottleneck departments. So the bottleneck department will be one of those departments at a time for different products. So let's see then. Identify the bottleneck department. We are told the total hours available in the factory is to be 30 hours. So that means we can't work over that 30 hours using our uh, own equipment. We've got demand for port 1 is 30 units, demand for port 2 is to be 50 units. Okay, not a problem. So we've got two departments in there, or different processes in there. The first department is pressing departments, the second department is the stretching department. So that means, okay, let's see then. 
We got a product one, it's most the product two for the hours that we need to process in each of these departments. So let's see them. In this pressing department, first of all, if we were to process all of these product one as well as the product two, so that would give me three hours per unit in a pressing department. In a scratching department, on the other hand, for product one as well as the product two, the total hours to be processed for each unit in the department, so stretching departments, is to be four hours per unit. So if that's the case then, so you can say, we only spend three hours in first department, but we need to spend four hours in the second one. And hence, surely, the second department would be the bottleneck, B for short, for the stretching department, okay? So, that is the quick way that we can determine the bottleneck. Another way that we can determine the bottleneck is we're going to consider also for the uh, demands in there and we're going to compare to the um, scarce resource which is 30 hours. So let's see them. Okay, so let me just to write them up first of all. So, we know the demand for pot one is to be 30 units. Demand for pot two is 50 units. Okay. So, in order to produce the pot one as well as the pot two in the pricing department, one times 30, so that would give me 30 hours. Two times 50, so that would give me 100 hours. So total, it will be 130 hours. But we only have got 30 hours available, and hence, for each of these, uh, for each of these products from the pressing departments, we've got a shortage of 100 hours, you agree? And we compare with the second department, so let me use red. Three times 30, so that would give me 90 hours. One times 50, so that would give me 50 hours. Plus them together, okay, we need 140 hours in department 2. But we only have got 30 hours available. So shortage for department 2 is 110 hours. So if that's the case then, there will be more shortage in the department 2 than in the department 1. And hence, surely, the department 2 will be a bottleneck. Okay, so that's two ways that we can do. So, before we dip into the differences between the throughput accounting with the marginal costing, the best way that we can say is on to the next page of the question called Accounting POC. So, let me explain all of these bits and pieces in this, in this particular question together. Required, calculate the profit under the traditional accounting measures and using a throughput accounting ratios measures. Okay, so let's see how we're going to uh, do this uh, together then. Now, accounting PLC. Accounting PLC produces product A and the capacity for each of these processes will be as follows. Uh, we've got three processes, which means the department. And we also got the capacity in unit, and we also have got the labour cost per unit in each of these processes. And as you can see, when looking at the capacity, we can deal with 10 units in process 1, but we can only deal with the 6 units in process 2. So surely the process 2 would be B, bottleneck. We've got 8 units in process 3, that's absolutely fine. So we identified that bottleneck already. We are told the material cost of $5 per unit and total material purchased by the accounting POC is to be 10. But in this case, under the traditional accounting, we recognise that 10 units of raw material, but we need to adjust for the closing inventory. Yes, as at the year end. And in this case, the maximum capacity is just to be 6 units. So that means, okay, even though you buy 10 units of raw material, but only six of them can be finished and sold. 
and hence we buy 10, we only sell 6, that means we got 4 units to become our closing inventory. And hence what we need to do, we recognize 10, and we minus 4, that will give us 6 units of cost that we need to recognize on the p &L, as well as the associated sales revenue. And hence, based upon the matching principle, or we can call it as the accruals concept, the profit that we can recognize, yes, based upon the matching principle, is based upon that six unit of products that we've sold, rather than ten. So that means under the traditional accounting method, we encourage some of the inefficiency exists. Okay, we toast the same prices to be 20, overheads to be 50, and each process requires one hour to produce one unit. So let's see then. First of all, under the traditional piano, all we can show is first of all we've got sales revenue based upon the number of units or six units that we can sell because it's the maximum capacity of six times the same price in this case is $20 per unit that would give me 120 units and we minus the cost of sales Oops. so the cost of sales is based upon 6 units again because we purchased 10 we can only uh, sell at six which means we've got four units of the closing inventory so 10 minus 4 that will give me six units according to the matching principle that can be turned into profit so first of all then we've got six units and for the associated cost first of all we've got the material cost of five and the total labor cost for all of these processes because in order to process one particular unit, it has to go through the process one, two, and three. So the total labor cost in this case is to be $14 per unit. Yeah? Plus the direct material cost of $5 per unit. And also we need to plus the overhead expenses in total is to be $50. That would give me 114. That would give me 50. And total them up, it will give me 164. So the profit, the gross profit that we can make is to be, in this case, it's not profit, but it's losses okay, of $44. So, under the traditional PL, okay, we only account for, according to the matching principle, is that six units of the product. Uh, but, I mean, in the uh, throughput accounting, on the other hand, we are not just considering that six units of pots, but rather we need to consider the 10 units uh, of the product. So, let's see that. So, the way that we can calculate the throughput accounting ratio is we take the return per factory hour. So, in this case, when related to hours, that should be the bottleneck hour. And we divide this by The costs, or we can call it the factory costs per factory hour. So again, that factory hour should be the bottleneck hour. Of course, we can either to calculate the return per factory hour per unit, or the factory cost per factory hour per unit. Alternatively, we can calculate the return per factory hour in total, as well as the factory cost per factory hour in total. So let's see how we're going to do this then. 
The return from the throughput accounting's perspective is we're going to consider, okay, what is the selling price times the number of units sold? Because by doing so, we can establish the total sales revenue, right? Are we going to minus, because we're going to calculate the return? In this case, we're going to calculate the material costs times the unit we've bought. Not sold. To reflect the fact that we have got the inefficiency assists. Our aim is to eliminate those inventories as much as possible. And that's the reason why instead of considering only 6 units that we've sold, we consider 10 units that we've bought related to those raw materials. So that will calculate the return. So you may have a question, well Steve, under the marginal cost day, that return is called the contribution. Under the marginal costing system, we calculate that contribution by using the selling price minus the variable costs, including the direct material labour as well as the overhead. But in the throughput accounting, the return is just a bit of revised terminology to the contribution. We only include the direct materials costs only because we cheat all this direct labour as well as the overhead expenses as the total factory costs as fixed. Because think about it in this way. If you open up a bar, okay, if you open up a bar, not only are you going to buy the raw materials, but I mean, you have to turn on the lights even though there will be no customers in your bar. Uh, you still have to incur those uh, overhead expenses. And hence, those tend to be fixed from a throughput accountant's perspective. Okay, so that's the logic behind it. Right, so we divide by the factory hour. And in this case, the factory hour, as I said, the factory hour for the bottleneck process. And in this case, is the process two. It's five dollars uh, per unit for labour costs, but the hour, as you can see, each process requires one hour to produce one unit. And that means in the process two, we got six units times one hour per unit. That will give me six hours in total. Yes, that will be the factory hour at the bottleneck, resource, uh, bottleneck department. So if that's the case then, right, if we were to calculate the price times the units that we've sold minus the material cost times the units that we've bought in total, we need to divide by the total factory hours worth of six. But maybe your examiner will simplify this idea related to return. Because, for example, we assume that our business is perfectly implementing a JIT system. And that means the units that we've sold will be equal to the units that we've bought. Because the idea behind the JIT system, or just-in-time inventory management system, is the pull approach, which means we pull the customer's order first, and then we start manufacturing it, and we, set, uh, and we deliver that to the customer. And that means we build up no inventories or closing inventory or inefficiency at all. So if that's the case then, all you can do is to calculate the return per factory hour. You can simply take the selling price per unit minus the direct material cost per unit and divide that by the uh, factory hour uh, per unit. So that'll be absolutely fine. But in this particular question, we accept there will be inefficiency assists, but our aim is to use the JIT system, and hence, yes, we um, are going to include uh, that element, for example, material cost times the use that we've bought. Uh, in this particular case, at the same time, we admit that there will be some of the idle time assists, because some of the labor will sit there because of inefficiency, and uh, that's the idea. And in this case, 
And certainly we're going to use the total factory hours worth of six. Okay? Because that's based upon the process two. Yeah? Right, so if that's the case then, first of all, slot the uh, numbers in. The price that we sold, again, is to be $20 per unit. We sold six units. We then minus the material costs. The direct material cost is to be $5 per unit. The units that we've bought, instead of buying six, we bought 10. So the return is to be $120 minus $50, and that will give me $70. And divide that by the factory hour in total, six hours, and in this case, it will give us the return per factory hour is to be $12 per hour. So that means by taking into account the bottleneck department, in this case the process 2, we can generate into $12. Okay? So we're going to compare that with the factory cost per factory hour. So let's see then. So we're going to divide this by factory costs per factory hour. So let's see how we're going to arrive at the factory cost then. Because we know that factory costs, we will include both of these direct labor costs, as well as the, all of these overhead expenses In the fact check. Because we tend to cheat them as fixed. Okay? So that's it. So the direct labor costs in total. So will be $14 in total, right? So we're gonna split that into different units there. So $3 times 10 units, so that would give me $30. 6 times 5, so that would give me 30. 8 times 6, that would give me 48. So in total, it should be $108. Okay. And we are told the overhead expenses to be 50. So that means we take 108 plus 50. That would give me 158. So that will be a total factory cost. So if it is in total terms, what will be a total factory hours then? So again, the total factory hour, we are only considering the bottleneck department for those factory hours. And in this case, the bottleneck process is the process number two. And hence, the total factory hours in the process two is to be six hours. Yeah. So simply take one eight one fifty eight, divide by six hours as the factory hour. So the factory cost per factory hour. So that would give me twenty six dollars per hour. So. If that's the case, then we slot that into the uh, pro forma. So that will give me 0.46, which is less than 1. I mean, the idea behind it is by producing this particular product, we can only get $12 as a return, but we have to pay for $26 of cost. And as a result of it, take into account that bottleneck resource department, this product is loss making. So all we can do is to say, right, we can either decrease the factory cost per factory hour, or alternatively, we're going to increase the return per factory hour. The way that we can decrease the factory cost per factory hour, perhaps we're going to increase the factory hours, because by increasing the factory hour, we are increasing capacity. Alternatively, we're going to decrease the factory cost, for example, decreasing the direct labor cost. Instead of using the skilled labor, we're going to use the semi-skilled labor. 
if we don't have to sacrifice our quality of the product. We can also decrease the overhead expenses. For example, um, rather than renting the factory in this particular area, we're going to rent the factory in that particular area and so on. We can increase the return. So for example, all we can do is, for example, we can decrease the materials that we've bought in order to meet with the uh, sales revenue that we've got, for example, operate the business under the just-in-time system to make sure the number of units that we've bought can be sold to, uh, by the business to a final customer. Decreasing the raw material cost, for example, using an alternative supplier with the cheap, co uh, cheap material, but at the same time, we don't have to, uh, we need to think about the quality issue. Or perhaps doing more marketing uh, campaigns to increase the units sold or simply put up a selling price. So if you put up a selling price, I mean, this will impact onto the units that you can sell. But those are just to be the ideas that you can improve that throughput accounting ratio. Okay. Right, uh, to improve the throughput accounting ratio. Okay. So, as you can see, if you were to operate using the traditional method, that means based upon the matching principle, and you only consider, for example, six units of those labor costs, which is at $14, which means $84 of the labor costs. But under the throughput accounting, you admit that there will be certain idle time that exists, so that rather than thinking about only $84 of the labor cost, you consider the direct labor cost in total worth of $108. Because you admit the idle time exists. At the same time, you aim to operate in the just-in-time system to eliminate those inventories. And hence, using a traditional uh, accounting method, you only consider $5 per unit of the direct material cost of that six units. Total will be $30 of the raw material cost. But in the throughput accounting, if you buy more and more material, surely this will reduce the return per factory hour. And as a result of it, as you can see, that you've considered $50 of the raw material costs rather than just $30. Because in this particular circumstance, you've got $20 worth of raw material will stay as the closing inventory becomes the inefficiency. Okay? So, by using throughput accounting, if we've got multiple products in a second, we can also do the ranking and produce the best production plan by taking into account those bottleneck department um, factors. But at the same time, in this particular question, we can see that this port is not making product. And all we can do is we're going to improve the business processes so that the throughput accounting can help with the management to make appropriate decisions related to those efficiency when we uh, operate a business. So before we dip into another question related to throughput accounting, I'm going to take you through to the note about the differences, as you can see, between the marginal costing and throughput accounting. So we know that from a marginal costing's perspective, when we calculate the contribution, we include all of those variable costs, including the direct material labour as well as the overhead expenses, such as the electricity and maintenance expense. But in the throughput accounting, the only variable elements that we can argue will be the direct material. Because think about uh, that you operate, uh, that you open up a bar. Uh, so, for example, even though you sell no jeans at all to a customer, you still have to um, employ the labour who work for you. Even though there will be no customers there, they have to sit there, get them paid. At the same time, you turn on the electricity, uh, you turn on the light and incur the electricity expenses. So we tend to cheat the direct labor as well as the overhead expenses as fixed. Okay? So under the marginal costing, for those fixed costs, after you calculate the contribution, we minus the fixed cost, and that will give us the net profit. But in the throughput accounting, 
Not only are we going to cheat those fixed costs such as the rental rate as fixed, but also we cheat those direct labour costs as fixed. And hence we calculate the total factory costs, those will be the total fixed costs under the throughput accounting method. So the contribution under the marginal costing, we take the sales revenue minus the variable costs and based upon the number of units that we've sold. But under the throughput accounting, we don't call it as the contribution, but rather we call it as the return. So at the return, we take the sales revenue, which means selling price minus the number of units that we've sold, minus only for the direct material costs times the number of units that we've bought rather than sold. Okay, so I hope you're absolutely happy with the difference between these two. It's a slight modification based upon the marginal costing that can help the management to make better decisions by taking into account those bottleneck resources exist in a company. So let's take these bits and pieces to another question. It's called the through limited. Okay, so let's see how we're going to apply all of these bits and pieces into this particular good question. So, requirements. I've got four requirements in there. First of all, we're going to identify the bottleneck process. That would be pretty straightforward, as you can see in the question. We've got the department called assembly department and finishing department, or we can call it the process, absolutely fine. So let's see that if we're to produce the product A, if we're to produce the part A as well as the part B in the assembly department, the total hours will be 0.5 plus 0.5 hours, which will be one hour. Well, that's in the finishing department, if we were to produce these two products, it will take us 1.75 hours in total. So a bottleneck we are referring to the department, not for the specific product. And hence, in this case, in the assembly department, we each incur one hour, but finishing department, 1.75 hours. And from that perspective, then, the finishing department will surely be a bottleneck. Okay? So, the answers are requirement one, easy. Requirement two, then, is to calculate the throughput accounting ratio for each of these products. So, we know that from our earliest example, we know that the throughput accounting ratio we take the return per factory hour divided by the factory cost per factory hour. So we know that um, the finishing department would be the um, bottleneck department. And as a result of it, from the polar A's perspective, the bottleneck hour because in this question, we assume that through limited carries no inventory or closing inventory because it operates the just-in-time system. So when we calculate the return per factory hour, we take the selling price per unit times the number of units that we've sold minus the direct material costs times the number of units that we've bought. And in this case, we assume that the number of units that we've sold will be equal to the number of units that we've bought because there will be no closing inventories in this particular case. So from that perspective then, in order to calculate the return per factory hour, we calculate the return per factory hour on the individual basis rather than in total. And that means we simply take the selling price per unit for port A, minus the direct material costs per unit for port A, because we think, we assume, that the unit will be the same, so we don't have to consider into that. So the factory hour per unit in the product A is to be 0.75 hours, and for the product B will simply be one hour. Okay? So if that's the case then, so for the product A, the return If you see the cost data, it's as follows below. We've got product A, we've got a selling price, we've got the direct material costs, and hence the return will simply be $19 per unit. You agree? For product B, 15 minus 9, so that will give me $6 per unit. So if that's the case then, for the product A, 
the return per unit is to be $19. We know that the Polar A factory hour bottleneck department is to be 0.75 hours. Yeah, We divide by 0.75 hours. So for the Polar B, the return, we take $6. We're going to divide this by the factory hour in the bottleneck department. In this case, for the Polar B, is to be 1, yeah? rather than 0.75. So, one hour. So what would be a total factory cost then? So, as you can see, we are told the factory overhead and direct labour expense for the period is to be $180,000. So if that's the case then, in the throughput accounting method, we cheat that $180,000 is fixed. So we take this $180,000 there. So the total factory costs, because it's in total terms, absolutely fine. For a product A, $180,000. That will be the same in a product B, $180,000. But what about for the total factory hours then? So, looking back to our processing capacity information we know that the finishing department is the bottleneck department and the hours available in total is the limiting hours which means yes uh, our uh, the number of units that we need to produce will be limited to those hours available in department one is 12,000 hours R is the same as the finishing department in this scenario. So, which 12,000 hours we should use? Of course, we need to use the second one rather than the first one because the second one, 12,000 hours, will be the bottleneck hours related to the finishing department. And hence, we take 12,000 hours as a total there. If you plot that into a calculator, the TPAR, or we can call it as the throughput accounting ratio, will simply be for number one is to be 1.67, and for the product B, if you plot that into a calculator, that will give you 0.4. Okay. So that's the answer for the number two. I hope it's not that difficult right now, okay? I've explained every bits and pieces in there. 1.67 uh, 1 and 0.4 for product A as well as the product B, so for the number two for calculation. So you can think about it in the, in, in the question three. Interpret the TPAR. So for the product A, why 1.67? It's simply because this would give me $25 per factory hour. This would give me $15 per factory hour. So that means the return is greater than costs in this particular case for the port A. And that's the reason why it's the TPAR for the port A is greater than one. It's a profit making product. For product B, on the other hand, the top is six dollars per hour, bottom is fifteen dollars per hour. And that means for each of these product B that we produce, the return from the bottleneck hour is just to be six. We have to pay for fifteen dollars worth of costs, and hence for product B is loss making product. And hence, first of all, we can argue that we are interpreting the TPAR. We can, for example, for a product B, we can increase the return per factory hour. So, for example, increase our selling price or increase our marketing spend. Alternatively, we're going to decrease the factory cost. So, for example, we're going to use the cheap labour. Alternatively, we're going to use another factory, rent another factory, rather than rent this factory in this particular area, for example. 
So those are the suggestions that you can make to this particular company. But on the other hand, in the question number four, prepare the optimal production plan based upon the throughput accounting concept. And that means you need to do the ranking. So in this case, because the product A throughput accounting ratio is greater than one, and all you can do is to say, right, I'm going to produce the product A first before the product B. And let's see, under this particular circumstance, of how we're going to use up the resources that we've got. And because, as you can see, the limiting hours in the finishing department, in this case, it's the bottleneck department, is to be 12,000 hours in total. And how we can use up that 12,000 hours in order to produce the product A first before the product B. So let's see how we're going to do this then. Number four. That is our exciting part. So, production plan based upon the bottleneck department. So, in this case, the hours available is to be 12,000 hours. We are only considering the bottleneck hours, which means the finishing department. So, how we can uh, utilize the uh, throughput accounting concept to produce the port A as well as the port B. So, first of all, based upon the ranking, we need to produce the port A first before the port B. Yeah? So, for the port A, as you can see in the question, according to a marketing department, the demand that we forecast is to be 10,000 units. We've only 4,000 units for the port B. So, first of all, let's see how we're going to deal with the port A first. Okay? So, for each of these port A that we have to produce, in the finishing department will be the bottleneck, which is not 0.75 hours for each of these port A. So, that means we've got... 10,000 unit that we forecast with 0.75 hours per unit. So that would give me 7,500 hours that we need to use up from this 12,000 hours in total to produce the port A. And the hours left is to be 4,500 hours. So that's the reason why we can start produce the product two or the product B. So in order to produce the product B, as you can see, the demands forecasted by sales department is only to be 4,000 units. And for each of these product B, we need to spend one hour to produce according to our bottleneck department. And in this case, for product B, we forecast it to be 4,000 units with one hour per unit. So we are not using 0.5 hours in the assembly because in the finishing department, that is the bottleneck department of one. So if that's the case then, that will give me 4,000 hours there for product B. So it can utilize the resources in this particular case. And hence, as you can see, there'll be 500 hours left. And we're gonna call this 500 hours as the idle time. And of course, by identifying this idle time 500 hours using a throughput accounting concept, you can say to your staff, okay, you don't have to work for that 500 hours, but you still get paid. You simply sit down and relax and drink coffee, but you still get paid. Perhaps that would be a benefit that you can offer to your employees. That would be quite generous, really. So, of course, you can also think about, okay, we're going to use up that idle time of 500 hours to reallocate that staff because we've got surplus capacity to other projects 
to earn additional contribution as a result of it. That's entirely up to you. So using that uh, throughput accounting, as you can say, let me just to um, bring you back to the theory part. Using that throughput accounting, we've got two applications. First of all, based upon the ranking, we can produce the optimal production plan similar to what we've seen in a limiting factor analysis, analysis decision. But the difference between these two is in the throughput accounting, we calculate the throughput accounting ratio so that we can do the ranking rather than just to based upon the contribution per uh, scarce resource as what we've seen in a limiting factor analysis decision. Uh, but at the same time, when we are producing the optimal production plan, we are focusing on the bottleneck department because it's that bottleneck department that will limit the overall speed or capacity of the company producing a product. So what we can do is we focus on that particular bottleneck department before we move any further. So that's the reason why ranking order absolutely key. And the way number two that we're going to use though is we're going to interpret the TPAR as the throughput accounting ratio. If it is less than one, all we can do is we're going to think about ways to improve its profitability as well as decreasing its costs. So that's all we can do. So let me just take you back to the throughput accounting concept. You can look at the introduction of throughput accounting on your own. But we are considering the factory as a whole, including those bots in the department. We also look at the concept behind the throughput accounting. So what do I mean by throughput is what I mean by return per factory hour. It's the rate at which the system generates money through sales. But by considering those bottleneck departments. And of course the throughput accounting is based upon the JIT system. And that means in most circumstances when calculating the return per factory hour, we simply take the return per unit of different pots and divide by the factory hour per unit. But alternatively, if the company has some of the closing inventory, all we need to do, we take the total sales revenue minus the direct material costs times the number of units that we have bought rather than we have sold. And that's the key difference between the throughput and the traditional accounting um, uh, system. So as you can see descriptions below, and of course we choose the direct labour cost as well as the overhead expenses as fixed throughout the period as well in the throughput accounting. And you can also look at the uh, calculation of the TPAR, it's the throughput accounting ratio, equals to one break even situation making no profit, no losses, more than one profit making product, less than one loss making product, it's not department. So how we calculate the TPAR? We take the return per factory hour divided by factory cost divided by uh, per factory hour. Can either be calculated using uh, per unit or in total as you can see. Okay. You can look at that on your own and also look at the difference between the marginal costing and the throughput accounting. Right so I'm going to stop here because that's the end for the throughput accounting. I hope you're absolutely happy with this very, very complicated concept in your exam. So look forward to seeing you in the next of our section and happy studying. APC, accounting for your future.